with uh, World Coffee Research, as uh, James indicated. For those of you who don't know, World Coffee Research is, um, is a, a collaborative uh, uh, effort uh, that is funded and, uh, and driven by the industry. It is uh, guided by the producers, the coffee producers, and it has the objective of uh, protecting and, uh, and ensuring that we have a future for specialty coffee, while at the same time we uh, improve the uh, livelihood of the families that produce the, the specialty coffee for us. So I've been doing research on plants for uh, over 20 years. And uh, uh, when I started working on coffee a couple of years ago, I actually became surprised to see how little, um, relatively little, was the amount of research that uh, has been done on coffee compared to other uh, commodities like uh, maize or, or rice. Uh, well, uh, some people may say, well, but you know, coffee is not a stable food as, as those other commodities that I just mentioned. But we're still talking about an uh, uh, agriculture crop that, um, that is, the, is the main uh, source of income for 25 million farmers around the world and, uh, and actually is also, uh, it gives the job to hundreds of millions of people, including all of us here. So why is uh, uh, the amount of research on coffee not as, as big as in other commodities? Well, the main reason is that uh, coffee is, is one of those uh, so-called uh, orphan crops that are grown in the tropics, but then they're exported, processed, and consumed in, in developed countries. And uh, so that has created a disconnect between the sites where this, uh, this commodity is, is grown and then the actual sites of, uh, of consumption. And at the same time, a lot of the producing countries uh, traditionally did not have the, the means to support uh, extensive research programs. Things have gotten a little bit better lately. We have uh, great examples of uh, uh, research programs that are conducted right at the, at the doorsteps of, of main producing areas like Colombia and, uh, and Brazil, of course, but there's still a lot of work to do. Overall, we're talking about uh, an industry that is worth an estimate of $170 billion. So we definitely uh, can do better. Orphan crops I mentioned, uh, uh, this is for example cocoa. Cocoa is another example, you know, very important worldwide, but at the same time, relatively small amount of research conducted. So why do we need research on coffee? You may be happy with what we have, uh, uh, but at the same time, we always have to look ahead and be ready for, for uh, adversities. Um, so we need uh, research because we still don't know a lot about coffee. First, we don't know how to deal with uh, a lot of the uh, pests and diseases. You know, of course, uh, uh, leaf rust is the first one that comes to mind, but we have the, the, the berry borer, we have uh, other uh, unknown, the potato taste defect. And uh, we also still don't know much about the relationship between what we do in the field and actually what we eventually have in the cup. Okay, that's a totally unknown world. So definitely um, a lot more uh, can be done. So when we started World Coffee Research a few years ago, the first objective was to understand the genetic diversity of the Arabica species, okay? Because we all know there are several varieties, uh, but, and we can kind of tell them apart ba based on the plant growth habit, based on, on, of course, quality. But at the same time, how do they uh, differ genetically from each other? Because everything ultimately goes back to genetics. Ideally, when, you, uh, when we entertain studies like this, we go uh, to the wild, uh, we uh, collect samples and bring them back to the lab, do some analysis uh, and, and, you know, kind of to understand where we are. Uh, however, you all know that it's pretty much impossible to go to Ethiopia and collect specimen from the wild. Um, this is actually a picture of the region where the original geisha uh, seeds were collected. So because we could not go to Ethiopia, we went to Katia. Katia is the, the center for agriculture research and higher education, and based in Costa Rica. And at Katia, they have an international coffee collection. Basically, it's like a museum of living uh, plants. And it's very important because uh, it contains uh, those plants that were the last ones to uh, be uh, authorized to leave Ethiopia. There were expeditions in the 50s and 60s, mainly uh, driven by the, the food and agriculture organizations that were allowed to go to Ethiopia, collect seeds, and bring them back and distribute it to, to uh, centers around the world as a, as a conservation effort and also a research effort. So at Katia, they have 11 different coffee species. They have about 1,900 
accessions, which means different uh, specimens, different varieties or, or land races, for a total of over 9,000 plants. Okay, they're all maintained there and, and cataloged, and we know exactly where they were collected and uh, where they're from. So what we did, we went ahead and, and sampled uh, leaves from uh, a a good range of these plants, about 900 of them. Uh, we dried them, we sent them to a, a private lab in, the, uh, in France, in southern France, uh, Adenide, where they extracted the DNA of those uh, plants. And after the DNA was extracted, it was sent to another private lab in New York, uh, state of New York, Nature Source Genetics. And uh, over there, they actually uh, analyzed this, uh, the, the DNA of all those accessions, of all those 900 plus plants. 249 billion base pairs. This is an incredible amount. If you're not familiar with the concept of base pair, base pair is actually the building block of the DNA, okay? The double helix of DNA, which we all have, all living organisms. And so, and of course, uh, this sequence is different from any, any of us and, and every uh, coffee plant, of course. So the results of this study were quite shocking because it actually came out that 98.8 was the results of the genetic similarity between all these 900 plus coffee plants. So that means that only 1.2% is the percentage of difference, genetic difference among all the species. This is a very, very surprising uh, result because usually you expect about 70 to 80% for most of the cultivated crops, okay? So yeah, they're pretty uh, genetically uniform because of course they've been bred and distributed. So 98.8 uh, genetic similarity is, is uh, uh, it's not a good sign. Uh, it means that pretty much all these plants, whether they collect from, from Ethiopia or they're one of the improved varieties, they are almost like cousins, okay? Not to say, you know, maybe brothers or sisters. And uh, also another uh, interesting result, which was also not very good, is that the 30 uh, most uh, commonly cultivated uh, Arabica uh, species actually already account for 43% of the genetic variability of the entire collection. So you're dealing with this 30, uh, you know, top, uh, top 30 uh, Arabica varieties, you already accounted for about half of the genetic diversity that we have with the Katia collection. And again, this is not good, because that means if you use those 30 to breed, you're pretty much doing a lot of inbreeding. You're not adding any, any external genes that may uh, help a little bit shake things up, uh, genetically speaking. What is the bottom line of this research? Well, basically, it means that the 11 million hectares of coffee that are grown around the world is uh, pretty much a monoculture, or very, very close to monoculture. And monoculture is not good uh, because uh, it, it, it favors uh, the buildup and spread of uh, diseases and pests, and also it creates a, a, a commodity that is not ready as a whole to face environmental threats. This is the highlands of Peru. Uh, about 8,000 years ago, the early Peruvians domesticated the potato. The potato was a wild, poisonous plant, and through breedings and a lot of perseverance, it was turned into a staple food that estimates that, that say there are about 5,000 different varieties of potatoes right now. The early Peruvians knew that it was important to have different potatoes for the north-facing slopes, uh, different potatoes for lower altitude, higher altitude, wet soils, uh, basic soil acidics, uh, all, all, all that. And they knew that it was important to maintain this uh, diversity to make sure that they were uh, able to, to go through uh, periods of drought or, or diseases and pests, okay? So because if anything happened to one, one variety of potato, the other ones were safe. When uh, uh, the potato came to Europe, it caused the rebirth of the north part of the uh, European continent because it adapted really well to the northern climate, the climate of northern Europe, and in particular Ireland. I'm sure you, you know the story of the potato in Ireland. It really thrived there. It adapted well to the soils, to, to the climate. And the only problem is that the Irish planted only one variety of potato called the lumper. So when in 1845, uh, a microorganism, Phytostera infestans, was introduced probably from, from Mexico, in any case from America, it pretty much wiped out the entire production of, of potato because it turned all the potatoes in the soil to mush. This trigger, famine, that lasted for about um, six years, it caused the death of one million uh, people and it forced another million to flee the country. If we go back to coffee, we can mention what happened in Ceylon in the late 1800s. 
because Ceylon was also a monoculture of coffee with very, very little genetic diversity. When rust was accidentally introduced from Africa, where the pathogen is from, also the whole production of coffee of the island was wiped out to the point that uh, now Ceylon is definitely not a place we associate the, with coffee anymore. So you understand that it is very important to make sure that, that we, uh, we work towards improving the genetic diversity of the Arabica species, or um, there is a serious threat that uh, you know, we, something may happen. Another, maybe more virulent uh, uh, rust uh, may come in and wipe out the entire production. Why is the genetic diversity of Arabica so, so little compared to other crop? Arabica is a very young species. They estimate that it was actually the, the product of an accidental fortuitous event across between Coffea eugenoides, which is Nandi coffee, and Coffea canephora, which is robusta. Okay? So it was somewhere between South Sudan and Eastern Congo that this happened. And of course, this original Arabica plant only once, because most likely it was a single event, then of course it spread and of course it, it reached all the way uh, to southern Ethiopia, okay, where, you know, which is the place that is usually associated with, uh, with the uh, Arabica. So 10,000 years ago is nothing in, in evolutionary times. So, so the species hasn't had the time to grow and, and uh, go through mutation and make it a more diverse uh, species uh, as we have for other commodities, for example. The threat of, of pests and disease is not the only concern when we talk about a narrow genetic diversity because uh, climate change is another big issue. We know that Arabica is a very climate sensitive species, okay? It doesn't uh, tolerate a big range in temperature. It has a pretty narrow band in altitude where it grows. Uh, and um, so another study that we were involved with was a study of the climate and the effect of climate change on Arabica. So we work with the uh, CIAT, which is the center of the International Center for Tropical Agriculture in Colombia. And the scientists there put together uh, a database. Actually, they started looking at uh, climate data for over 3,500 locations around the world where Arabica is grown. They were able to put together maps and also forecast what the climate is going to be uh, just 35 years down the road in 2050, okay? using the, the models that are used uh, for climate change studies. And the results were quite uh, shocking. Here is a map, one of the many that were produced by, by the study. On the left, you have a, a map of Brazil. All these colors indicate the different ecological zones where uh, we can actually grow Arabica more or less successfully, depending on, on rain patterns and, and, and temperatures. The map on the right is the situation in 2050. Okay? So you can see that the surface the land that will be, where we'll be able to grow Arabica in just 35 years is shrunk to about a third. And the same deal is, uh, is true for all the other Arabica growing countries. So we definitely have, we have a problem. Uh, so what are we going to do uh, to, to face this? Are we actually going to try to cool the climate or are we going to try to change the, the genetics of Arabica? We chose the second option because we think it's a little easier, okay? So we have three strategies. The first one is that we go back, we actually we already went back to the genetic studies of 249 billion base pairs, and we got a top 50 list of the most diverse, uh, pure Ethiopian land races. We, have, we collected the seeds from Katia and we distributed to a, a few uh, breeding centers around the world. These seeds have already been planted and uh, plants are, are growing right now. When they reach maturity, we're going to breed them. So basically we use parents, they're already kind of at the extreme of the uh, range of genetic diversity to, to favor, you know, actually a, a little bit of, of uh, um, improve the genetic diversity. The second approach is uh, to uh, use Robusta. And I see, uh, I don't see because of the lights, but I know some of you are like, ooh, uh, don't say that word. Actually, Robusta has uh, some good characteristics. Uh, it has uh, the genes, they are responsible for uh, heat tolerance, drought tolerance, uh, not to mention rust resistance. So we're going to try to introduce those genes uh, into some pure Arabica and uh, basically do something that's been done before with the Timor hybrids, okay? This is not new, but we're gonna, now that we have the genetic uh, means and the, the scientific uh, tools to do that more accurately, hopefully we'll be able to screen uh, for those genes and eliminate those uh, um, characteristics that Robusta has that are not uh, desired. 
the third approach is the one that's going to deliver the results in the longest time, but we believe that it's probably going to give results that are going to be more significant. And basically, we're going to try to recreate the additional cross uh, that happened 10,000 years ago between the Nandi and the Robusta coffees, and we're going to create in control conditions new synthetic Arabica. I don't really like that term because it sounds artificial. But basically, we're going to create new Arabicas by using new parents. So it's going to be Arabica, but it's going to bring new sets of genes okay, to the pool. And hopefully, who knows, um, possibly uh, excellent uh, characteristics in, in growth and quality and resistance, of course. Of course, it's crucial to have varieties that are resistant to pests, the disease, and climate change, but ultimately, we care about quality. This is why we've teamed up with Kansas State University to, uh, to develop a lexicon, and basically, it's a, it's a vocabulary of 108 attributes that will be used to describe the sensory characteristics of, of quality uh, um, coffee and uh, to do it in a repeatable way and a scientific way, okay? So this uh, 108 attributes all have uh, um, a definition and they also have references so that panels can be trained around the world to um, evaluate the, the, the sensory attributes of that coffee in pretty much an unbiased and possibly as uniform way as possible. This tool is, is going to be published uh, uh, very soon by the end of the year and it's going to be, uh, of course, available to everyone, uh, so um, hopefully that, that will help anytime we have to do research and uh, especially location, different locations around the world. World Coffee Research was conceived in a room like this a few years ago at the Specialty Coffee Association of America Symposium, where scientists and, and industry leaders like you realized that there was an urgency. There was an urgency to, to start doing serious research on coffee. But back then, we didn't even know that uh, the genetic diversity of Arabica is so small, and we didn't know what the effects of uh, uh, climate change are going to be. This is research that just came out in the last, last year, actually. So um, we believe that we're, we're actually already too late to do this type of research, because if this had been done 20, 30 years ago, maybe we would not, we would not have had a, a rust crisis in 2012, because we would have already access to a more uh, diverse uh, Arabica pool of, of varieties. So um, I really want to thank uh, you know, all the, the uh, supporters and WCR members and sponsors because this is an effort that is funded by the industry. And uh, uh, without the support uh, from the industry, we would not be here. I would not be here. We would not be doing any of this uh, very expensive research. If you haven't looked at our website, uh, I, I encourage you to take a look, uh, worldcoffeeresearch.org, where you can see the, all the results that we have right now are, are there. Uh, and if they're not, that's because we're still processing the data. But uh, I really um, I want to encourage you to, to consider uh, joining our, our uh, journey and come on board uh, to, to develop the future of uh, specialty coffee through openly shared research. Thank you.